to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the lord is not slow concerning his promises as some count slowness but is long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance second peter chapter 3 and verse 9 welcome to our study of second peter in this lesson, in chapters 2 and 3, Peter is going to remind us that false teachers and false teaching does exist and we must beware of it or we'll miss out on God's promises and all the things that God has given to us. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter makes the point that even among God's people, false teachers do exist. Notice 2 Peter 2 verse 1, Peter says, Just as there were false prophets among the people, even so there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. Friends, to bury our head in the sand and act like everybody everywhere is teaching the truth and anybody that stands up with any religious persona must be of God is utter foolishness. We've got to realize false teachers exist in the world and false teachers exist in the church. Peter says it. The Bible says it over and over again. Jesus said it. Matthew 7 verse 15. Jesus said there would be wolves in sheep's clothing who would try to destroy the flock. Revelation 2 and 3, even among the churches in Revelation, Revelation, there was those who were teaching the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. There were those who were following Jezebel. There were false teachers then. Jesus promised it would be. And there are false teachers today. Jude 3 says we've got to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints for certain men of crept in who long ago were marked out for their condemnation ungodly men who turned the grace of our Lord Jesus into lewdness and denied the only Lord God. Friend, there are false teachers in the church today and we've got to make sure we don't allow their teaching to corrupt us. 1 Timothy 1 verses 18 through 20 Paul said that some had suffered shipwreck concerning the faith of whom were Hymenaeus and Alexander. And Paul said, I delivered them to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. To make sure and remember that false teachers exist is a valid principle for us. And as we think about how that false teachers do exist, we need to realize we've got to be wary. We've got to be on the watch for them. And here's the best way to do that. 1 John 4, verses 1 through 4, John said, Test the spirits to see if they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. You've got to test every teacher you hear to make sure he's of God. And you know what? Someone who teaches the truth won't get mad about that, and they won't get upset. They'll appreciate you for it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 says we're to prove all things hold fast that which is good. Anytime you hear someone preaching the gospel, you get your own Bible. You check and see. You do, do what they did in Acts 17, 11. Hear what they got to say and search the scriptures to see if it's true. And friend, we need to remember ourselves that we need not teach error for there is a punishment coming on false teachers. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4 following identifies that punishment. It will be like the angels, the angels who sinned and did not keep their proper abode, God is reserved in chains of darkness for the eternal punishment. These false teachers are one day going to be judged like the angels who disobeyed God. These false teachers are going to receive judgment and punishment like the unrighteous world in the days of Noah. They perished in the time of Noah for their ungodliness. 
And so today it is with false teachers. They're like those in Sodom and Gomorrah, according to verses 5 and 6 and the book of Jude. They're seeking selfish lust. They're out for what they can get out of it, for their fun, their desire, and their passion. And they don't care who they take with them as long as they have a lot of fun on the way. Too many false teachers, and we've seen it in our day and age, are more concerned about the almighty dollar than they are about pleasing the Almighty Himself. So many of these teachers and religious people who get on TV and claim they can do all these things always ended up by saying, and if you believe what's been said today, just write us a check and send it in. Friend, here's what's unique about New Testament Christianity. We're not concerned about your wallet book. We're concerned about your soul. We want you to check what we say and make sure that it's true to the Word of God. And then if you do, we're not going to ask you to send a big check in. We're going to ask you to get your life in line with the will of God and give as God commanded on the first day of the week at the local congregation. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And so there are false teachers. Their punishment is coming. You always check what you hear. And if it's according to the will of God, obey it because God said it, not because men did. Another reminder that Peter gives us is that any time we live in a sinful environment or area, it's going to oppress and torment us. Look at 2 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, And God delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day, to day by day, seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Lot was a righteous man. He tried to do what was right, but he was living in sin city, Sodom and Gomorrah. And that unrighteous city oppressed and tormented his righteous soul. What does Peter want us to remember here? Remember that if you live in and have yourself in an environment where sin is rampant, it's going to oppress and torment you. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, God says, Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. I'll be your God and you shall be my people. Paul said we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And Paul later said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Evil companions corrupt good morals. Now, are we saying to you today that you don't have to live in the world? Of course not. All of us have to live in the world, but friends, we don't have to surround ourselves. We don't have to have as our closest friends and companions ungodly and immoral people. If we surround ourselves and that's all we have around us, how are we going to be the kind of people God wants us to be? If we're running around with ungodly people and they're our closest friends, they're eventually going to rub off on us. And so realize, remember, you get yourself in a sinful area or environment, it's going to oppress your righteous soul and wreak havoc on you. Then in verses 9 and 10, we also learn that even though Lot was in an ungodly area, God knows how to deliver the godly out of that and punish the ungodly. Look in verses 9 and 10 of Second Peter 2. The Bible says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under, pun under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise authority. They're presumptuous, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. God knows how to deliver the righteous out of those things. Well, how will God do that? There's a day coming, the Bible says, when the Lord will come in flaming fire to take vengeance on those who know not God and those who have not obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these we punished with everlasting fire. The Bible says that at the same time, though, here's what's unique about it. God at that moment will destroy the unrighteous, but the Bible says then in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we're not to weep or sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus, the Lord, died and rose again, even so we'll rise with Him. We'll be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so at His coming, ultimately, God will punish the ungodly, and He will bring the righteous up with Him. But in a physical sense, in a worldly sense, in the here and now, does not God also today know how to deliver the godly? 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to men, but God who is faithful with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you'll be able to bear it. Our God knows how to deliver us ultimately, and He knows how to deliver us in the here and now. What's that mean for us? We've got to trust Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3 verse 5. We've got to seek His will to see if we're letting Him deliver us by His teaching. And ultimately, we've got to be faithful so when the great day of deliverance comes, we'll be ready for that. But you know, as we think about how false teachers do exist, what's the main problem with false teachers? Peter reminds us that the main problem with false teachers is their disregard, absolute disregard, for authority of any kind except their own. Look in verses 10 and 11 of this text. The Bible says these are not afraid, last part of verse 10, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. What's the problem with false teachers? They have an absolute disregard for the authority of Scripture, anybody's authority except theirs. My friends, false teachers have a pride problem. They want themselves to have the preeminence when it only belongs to Jesus. Colossians 1 verse 18. They've yet to realize Jesus has all authority. Matthew 28 verse 18. We're not to add to or take away from the Word. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. We're not to go beyond that which is written. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. And we've got to only speak as the oracles of God. And so when we think about false teachers and how they do exist, let's realize their problem is a problem with authority. And let's ourselves submit to the authority of God. Here's the best advice I could ever give you. At the wedding in Cana, in John chapter 2, verse 5, the uh, wedding feast, at the wedding feast, they've run out of wine. And in the context, Jesus' mother asked Him to give them more wine, to perform a miracle in essence. Jesus tells her, my hour's not yet come. He does agree to go ahead and do that, it's, you see from the text. But here's what Jesus' mother turns and says to the servants. Whatever He says to you, whatever He, Jesus, says to you, do it. My friends, we need to have the mindset that whatever Jesus says, I'm not the authority, I don't make the decisions, I am to follow Christ, He is my leader. I need to have the mindset, whatever Jesus says, I'm going to do it because He's the head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. He has all authority, Matthew 28, 18. And it's His Word, not the Word of men, that will judge me in the last day. But you know, when we think about, when we think about false teachers and false teaching and, and how dangerous that is, let's realize that if we give in to that false teaching, if we give in then to false living and false practices, it's going to be worse for me as a child of God if I'm lost than it will be for someone who's never heard the truth. Now, notice what the Bible says in 2 Peter 2, verses 20 through 22. The Scripture says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, that means they've obeyed the gospel, become a Christian, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. Listen, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them to have not known the way of truth or righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Be sure from this context, these people had obeyed the gospel and were Christians. The Bible says they escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They came out of the world, they got the stain of sin off of them, and then the Bible says they got entangled in it again, and what's it like for that person? Well, the Bible says the latter part is worse for them than the beginning. It had been better for them had they not known the way of truth. How's it going to be worse for them if someone who never hears the gospel and goes to hell, and then there's someone who's heard it and falls away, how's it going to be worse for the latter person? 
they're both going to have the same punishment, hell fire, but it'll be worse for the latter person because they knew the way of truth and they gave it up. Imagine this. That person is going to sit in the halls of hell and is going to think for all eternity, I was a child of God and I gave it up. I held the pearl of great price in my hand. I knew what it was like to be saved and I gave all that up. You see, it's going to be worse for them because they know the goodness of God and salvation. They know every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there's no shadow or variation of turning. For them, it's worse because to go back into sin, they have to sear their conscience. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 4. Now, friend, there is a very practical, a very practical principle to be learned here, and it's this. A child of God can so sin as to be lost and perish in hell. Friend, if there was ever, if there was ever a passage that teaches this principle, this is it. They escaped the pollutions of the world, they got entangled in them again, and the latter end is worse for them from the beginning. How can that be the case if they're never a child of God? And how's it like? Look at the disgusting nature of it. Like a dog returning to his own vomit. You say, that's disgusting. Absolutely, it's disgusting when a child of God turns from the holy way and goes into sin. It's like a sow having been washed returns to the wallowing in the mire. That's dirty. Absolutely, it is. It's dirty when a clean child of God leaves the way of righteousness and goes for the paths of filthiness. And so, yes, a child of God can so sinners be lost if they get caught up in false teaching. And thus, it's very important for us to realize there are false teachers, there are scoffers, there are those who are always claiming they've got some new truth or figured something out that the Bible is, you know, always taught but with their help. Now we can know it. Friend, let's realize we need to be reminded of the same old truths. Those old truths we've heard from the Bible, read from the Bible all our life. Those are the things that will get us to heaven. And that's what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Notice Peter says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stirred up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Those same truths that the prophets spoke, that Jesus taught, that the apostles taught, those are the things that we need to be hearing and living our lives by today. It, there's not some newfangled idea that's going to come along is going to bring great light to everybody. People have always been looking for that. But friends, the same truths we hear today are the same truths people need to hear a thousand years from now. Jeremiah 10.23 teaches us the way of man's not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. People have always been trying to do it their way, but God's way is the only way that will save. Jeremiah cried out, stand, stand in the way and see and ask for the old path where the good way is and there you'll find rest for your soul. They didn't want that old path. They said, we will not walk in it. And so many have that mindset today. Well, what particular doctrine is it that Peter is wanting to deal with? There are certain scoffers who are now saying that the claims of the Lord are not true. If you look in 2 Peter chapter 3, about verses 1 through 7, it has to deal with the second coming of Christ. They say uh, that the Lord said He's coming, that coming hasn't happened yet, and therefore everything remains the same from the day one of creation and nothing's different. Peter says that's not true. And here's how you can know that. There have been some major catastrophic changes since the moment of creation. M changes took place after God said, let there be light. There were multitudes of changes that took place after that, even in creation itself, Peter says in verse 5. And then he says, what about this? Have you forgot about the flood? Verse 6, that was a major catastrophic change that happened after the creation. That same word that set both of these events in motion is what's going to set the second coming of our Lord in motion. It's not the fact that God is slow concerning His promises. It's not the fact that there isn't any proof. Here's all the proof you need. God said it. That settles it. That's the proof. Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. And then He said, No man knows the day nor the hour of the Lord's coming. 
You see, the problem that many people have with the second coming of Christ is time. But here's the problem. Just like time is so precious to us and we can't live our lives without it, God's not bound by time. To the Lord, one day is a thousand years, a thousand years, one day. What's that mean? God's not bound by time. God doesn't have a clock that ticks 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and 24 hours in a day. God is not bound by time. And so we say to ourselves, well, God said His Son's coming, and we've been here so many years since then, and so, God, what's wrong? Is your clock broke? What's wrong? Is your calendar not working? God's not bound by time. Time was created for man, and God does, thing on, does things on His time schedule, not on our time schedule. And so we don't know when God's going to come, and thank goodness we don't, because we'd probably all wait right up to the end and get right. But here's what we do know. The Lord's not slow concerning His promises. The Lord is long-suffering for His promises. Look in 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Peter says the problem is not, not that of time, but the problem is that of the importance of souls. He says in verse 9, the Lord's not slow concerning His promises, as some count slowness. What is it then? He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is one of the hold-ups we might say? What is one of the things God's waiting on? God loves lost souls enough that He's giving them time to get right. God wants all men to repent and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. The moment Christ comes back, no more time for repentance. Thus, God doesn't want anybody to go to hell, and He is giving men and women ample time to get ready. You know, instead of scoffing, these scoffers really ought to be saying, thank you, God, that you've given me the time to learn, to repent, and to get ready for your coming. It's not slowness. God's not slow. God is long-suffering. He cares enough about people that He's giving them the time to get their life ready. Now, concerning the second coming, we do learn several things about its nature, what it's going to be like. Look in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. The Bible says, "...but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will, or the element will burn with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt, with fervent heat. What's it going to be like when Christ comes? It's going to be like a thief in the night. What's that mean? It's going to be quick, sudden, when you're not expecting it. What else is going to happen? The heavens are going to pass away with a great noise, according to verse 10. The elements, the earth and the works in them are going to be burned up with tremendous heat. The heavens are going to be dissolved, verse 12. The righteous are going to meet Christ in the air, First Thessalonians 4. All are going to come forth out of the graves, John 5, 28 and 29, and the bodies we now have are going to be changed. Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21, and 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 following. And so all these things are going to, are going to take place in, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we've got to be ready in the here and now. Now, that's the, here's the application. That's the truth. Here's the application to it. Look in verse 11. Since Christ is still coming, live a holy life. Notice verse 11. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness? The point is, this is the way you ought to live your life since Christ is still coming. Without holiness, no one will see God. Hebrews 12, verse 14. The Bible says, Be holy as He who called you is holy. Jesus said, Watch and be ready, for you know not the hour when the Lord comes. Mark 13, verse 35. And thus we stay holy and we look forward to that new heaven and that new earth. Spoken of in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4, where there be no more sorrow, death, crying, tears, all the former things have passed away. Spoken of as a city whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11, verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 and 2. And thus, the second coming of Christ is not something that ought to give us trouble, not something we even ought to bring the matter of time into, but rather, it's something we ought to anticipate and look forward to. Paul said, I consider the suffering at this present time not even worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Colossians 3, verse 1, Paul said, If then we are raised with Christ... 
We're to seek those things above where Christ is. Friend, Jesus is still coming. The second coming is a biblical idea. Hebrews 9, verse 27 and 28, Jesus will come a second time, come again, apart from sin for salvation. The first time Jesus came was to deal with sin. The second time will be salvation of those who have stayed true to His calls and the destruction, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, of those who have not lived faithful life. Friend, in view of that fact, that false teachers do exist, and that the Lord is still coming, we ask you, are you ready for the second coming of Christ? Friend, have you allowed false teaching to cause you to go astray? Are you sure today that you're right with God? Are you sure you've done what the Bible says, not what some man taught you to do? Here's what God says you've got to do for salvation. In Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch where uh, the Ethiopian eunuch's traveling down the road, the Spirit tells Philip to go over and overtake him. He's up there reading the Scripture, and Philip says, understand what thou readest? You've got to understand and read the Scripture to be saved. You've got to hear the Word of God. He said, how can I unless some man teach me? He taught him to believe in Jesus. John chapter 8, verse 24. He taught that man, no doubt, about repentance. Repentance is key to salvation. Luke 13, 3. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. They came to a certain water. He said, hey, you've been talking about it. Here's water. What hinders me? And he made the good confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And then both Philip and the eunuch got down out of the chariot. They went down in the water. He baptized him, and they came up out of the water to be saved. You've also got to be baptized in water. Acts 2, 38. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. If you're not a child of God, you desperately need to become one. We have no knowledge of when Christ is coming back. Therefore, we must make sure we're ready. And those of us who are Christians, are members of the body of Christ, let's not be ignorant. Let's not act like everybody out there is teaching the truth and anybody that stands in a pulpit must be of God. Let's check the Scriptures and see. Let's have the attitude of the Bereans. They received it with readiness of mind, and they searched the Scriptures to see if it was right. And let's stand up against false teaching. Let's contend for the faith, and let's ourselves live a holy life in view of the second coming. Friend, there's nothing greater in all the world than being a Christian and being ready for the great day of Jesus' coming. Are you ready? Are you sure you're ready? Have you obeyed the gospel, and is your faith built on the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If not, won't you make it right today? We love you and won't you go to heaven? Won't you obey the gospel of Christ? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.